and welcome back to our next series in this growth class. We're doing uh, selections from the Psalms, so we're going to introduce that today. Um, and I just want to begin just with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our lesson today. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Psalms, how they speak to us in somewhat unique ways that resonate with our hearts. And Lord, I pray that uh, today and through this series that you would captivate our hearts with the Psalms. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be fruitful. And we thank you, Lord, for the blessing that we have in taking refuge in your Son. Speak to us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned in the prayer, I think you know, the Psalms are a very unique book in a number of ways. And I think, generally speaking, I don't know if this is your experience, maybe this is how you feel, um, the Psalms are probably most people's favorite book in the Scriptures. You know, they may not be reading anything else, but they may pick up their Bible and read a psalm. You know, why is that the case? I think people love the psalms, not just because they're short, or at least I hope that's not the only reason. <laughs> they're sort of self-contained, short little things. Um, but we connect with them emotionally. Uh, you know, they hit us where we live and how we feel. Uh, John Calvin, in his commentary on the psalms and sort of the introduction to it, he says he, he calls the Psalms an anatomy of all parts of the soul. He says, For there is not an emotion which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. So we see the psalmist's emotions played out, but also we see ourselves in these emotions. Because we feel those same things. And in many ways, the Psalms help us to express those emotions and deal with them appropriately before God. Now, another thing to consider as we uh, move into this topic in this book of the Psalms is to consider that they are not only prayers and songs to God by the psalmist, God's people, but they're also God's words to us. Now, that's a strange dynamic. Here we have someone's, you know, David, for instance, uh, praying about his suffering unto God. Yet at the same time, we believe the inspired scriptures are also God's words to us. So how does that, what is God telling us through the words of a sufferer or someone who's crying out for help? I think that's an interesting thing to consider. One example of this we see in Psalm 42, verse 8. Um, he says, By day the Lord commands His steadfast love, and at night His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. So in that one verse we see simultaneously, here's uh, God's song being expressed by uh, the psalmist in a prayer. And I think this has profound implications for prayer, practically, and we're going to talk about that towards the end of our time this morning. So as we begin our study on selections from the Psalms, what I want to do today, you'll see on your notes, is I want to provide sort of a basic introduction to the Psalms as a whole. And then we're going to look briefly at Psalm 1 and 2. So point one on your outline there, the structure of the Psalter. When I say Psalter, I just mean all 150 Psalms. You know, one helpful strategy if you're reading a book, like a, a nonfiction book, for instance, a helpful strategy is to look at the table of contents and read the preface. Most people usually don't, they jump into the first chapter, but it's helpful to read the preface. It's helpful to look over the table of contents because you know where it's headed. You know what's going to be covered. So when you get into the details of the book, however detailed it is, you know how to organize those details. Um, you, know, you, you don't 
you avoid the mistake of losing the forest for the trees, as people say. Or maybe a more contemporary illustration, let's say you're, uh, you're going somewhere and you pull out your phone, you pull out the MapQuest or whatever equivalent you use, and you've never been here before, and you dial in the address and it zeroes in to the particular place. But usually, maybe you, usually you probably do this, is you back it out. So you can see, oh, the relationship, okay, that's close to this, and I know how to get there, so I have an idea. So in the same way, we're kind of doing that with the psalms. Instead of jumping in right away to a particular psalm and the details, we're kind of painting out. And we're getting a, a taste for, you know, where is this whole thing uh, going? How is it organized? So we're going to do that with the psalms. Now, it raises the question, is it organized? Is there a structure to the psalms? I think most people read the psalms sort of, maybe they just read one a day and move through that way, but sort of treat each one as its own thing, its own independent prayer or song to God. Uh, don't really think about the relationship between the psalms. It's not like other books, you know, where you, you know, Paul's letters or something, where you um, see the logical progression through the whole book. Is there a structure to the psalms, or is it a random collection? So I want to look at that briefly. If you know in your Bibles, you'll see that the Psalms are broken down into five books, five collections of Psalms. Most of your Bibles will make that clear. Um, there's been discussion and debate about you know why five, and we're not going to get into that today. But um, there are five books. And these were collected over a period of time, a long period of time, as a matter of fact. Probably the earliest psalm written, at least that we know of, by indication in the text, is Psalm of Moses, which is Psalm 90. So we're talking back in the time of the Exodus, in and around that time. But then you have you know, David's time, and then those that came after him mentioned in Chronicles and other places. So it's really roughly, you're looking at a thousand year period when these psalms were written and collected over time um, as songs were added to the Psalter. Now, okay, you got the general five books, but let's, you know, on closer examination, what else can we observe about the structure of the psalms? Well, you'll notice it, on closer examination that each book ends with a doxology, a hymn of praise unto God, ultimately ending in a large doxology at the end of book five. Also, you'll see in the scenes of these books, which I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the four scenes, the in-betweens, you'll see a wisdom psalm paired with a royal psalm. So there's sort of this wisdom teaching, stuff that mirrors uh, what you find in the book of Proverbs, with a royal psalm talking about the reign of God or the reign of God's anointed, the Messiah. Many think this is a thematic arrangement. So these two themes are important throughout the psalms. Also, just side note, they're not arranged in chronological order. We, stop, we find uh, Davidic Psalms throughout. Um, so they're not necessarily in chronological order. And the overall movement thematically in the Psalter is from more lament Psalms at the beginning to more praise or hymns of praise at the end. So this movement from lament to praise if you think about it, that really mirrors, uh, in a lot of ways, what we find in the history of redemption, right? Fall, suffering, conflict between the righteous and the wicked, and how that pans out in this world. But then a movement to the work of Christ and the great blessing ahead for God's people. So that's kind of, those are some overall observations about the structure of this altar. Now, another key feature in this structure is what most 
scholars identify as the introduction to the whole thing. And they see that in Psalm 1 and 2, which we're going to look at today. Uh, Palmer Robertson calls these two psalms the poetic pillars of the entire collection. And he means that they anticipate a lot of the major themes seen throughout the 150 psalms. So turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, either hard copy or digital, turn to Psalm 1. I'm just going to read that for us. And with, with each one of these psalms, I'm just going to make some highlight observations and some applications along the way. So Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Then you see this as a wisdom psalm. There's a lot of characteristics in this psalm that uh, you find in the book of Proverbs, for instance. Um, especially the contrast between the wicked and the righteous and instruction for uh, how to live. One of the things we see just in passing is that in verses 1 and 2, uh, well, one in particular with regard to the wicked, there's a progression of sorts. You know, counsel of the wicked, uh, you know, walking in the counsel of the wicked, sitting in the seat of scoffers, uh, you know, standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers is sort of a uh, walking, standing, and a sitting. And their participation in wickedness. And this interesting contrast to what we find in like the book of Deuteronomy, where you, you have God's law being talked about and how the people should respond to that law. They should meditate on it and think about it when they sit, when they walk, when they lie down, when they get up as a part of their everyday life. So there's two types of people being contrasted here. And we'll see this again throughout all of the Psalms. Uh, but it's interesting that they're based on their relationship to a word, this distinguishing characteristic, okay? What word is the wicked gathering around or entertaining or interacting with? The counsel, counsel of the wicked, which is in opposition to the law of the Lord, which the righteous man meditates on day and night. So there's a relationship to the word in terms of the distinction between the two groups. With all wisdom literature, the, the purpose is really to teach and instruct. So Psalm 1 really gives us, uh, in some ways, the purpose of the Psalter as a whole. It's an instruction manual or guidebook for blessing. And you'll, we'll see this throughout. But we might ask, well, what instruction does it give in particular? Well, it's interesting that it relates um, this blessing uh, with, with a happiness or a blessedness. You know, what does that look like in this psalm? It uses the image of a tree. You'll see there in uh, verse 3, in terms of this contrast, you have the righteous man is alive. This is all contrasted with chaff. Okay? So he's alive, he's not dead, like chaff is. He's enduring versus being scattered. 
and he's fruitful, rather than being good for nothing. And you know, think about other ways in which the scriptures use this image of fruitfulness or non-fruitfulness. Jesus uses it all the time. And it's interesting that imagery is also used of God in the scriptures. God is depicted as a fruitful tree. Uh, I'll give you an example from the book of Hosea, which we just finished actually in our reading challenge. Hosea 14 likens God to an evergreen cypress. His people's fruit comes from him because God himself is the fountain of life. He's the fruit. He provides fruit for his people. And then again, this is the opposite of perishing or being uh, destroyed, cast off. So just by way of summary in this psalm, uh, you know, being blessed or happy refers to a fruitful state of well-being accompanied by joy, satisfaction, and delight. And it's not restricted to this world. There's a forward-looking also element to it. Because you may read something like, um, the end of verse 3, talking about the righteous man. And all that he does, he prospers. Is that really true? Does the righteous man always prosper? Or is there sometimes suffering in this life? And that's... In many ways, the psalmists wrestle with that. Psalm 73 is a perfect example. Um, and that's where the psalmist is saying, look, the, the righteous are suffering and the wicked are at ease. You know, they, they don't have any problems. And his solution to that dilemma, that tension, is really, as it says, going into the sanctuary of the Lord and discerning the reality of things, and getting perspective. So the Psalter is an instruction manual in, in many ways for living a blessed life, enjoying blessing from God. Even if we are reviled here by the wicked in this world. So blessing, I use kind of interchangeably, happiness and blessing, those renderings of the same word, although we tend to associate happiness with more superficial things, but I'm speaking in terms of how Scripture defines it. How is happiness obtained? And I think implied in this psalm, it's through righteousness, which again is closely related to holiness. That's where blessedness is found, being like God, being imitators of God. Is that how you see holiness? Is that how you see righteousness in your own mind? You know, the world would say, that's a path to misery. Being righteous and holy, it's no fun. It's, it's uh, full of trouble. It reminds me of, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the character, maybe it was the, in Pilgrim's Progress, worldly wise man. Uh, at the beginning of the book, he tells Christian this path that he's, uh, he set himself on is the path of misery, basically. This is the hardest path you'll choose in this life. Why not choose something else? You only live once. Why waste it on this? So this is a real problem, a temptation for us to Think of holiness as something that's not good, it's not fun, it's not doesn't lead to blessing. That's not how scripture talks about it. Holiness is the path to happiness. Think about it this way. God's utterly holy, he's utterly righteous. Is he a joyful God or is he in misery? Yeah. Studies of the attributes of God talk about the blessedness of God, the happiness of God within His triune being, full of joy. That's why He's able to give joy. 
fruit of the Spirit. And we also know that from this psalm that it's what's involved in this pursuit of holiness and righteousness is meditating on God's Word. Um, meditation is not a term we use a lot, but I, I think of it as communion with God. I think of it as, um, you know, we read the Word, we think about it, we talk to God about it. Very simply, that's what I mean by meditation. I think that's what Scripture means. It's not some mystical thing apart from the Word of God, but it's a, it's a communion with God in the Word, through the Word. So, by implication, neglect of the Word of God and meditation, as I've defined it, will negatively affect your holiness and happiness. How many of us struggle with that? You know, we, yeah, we want to experience blessing, want to experience joy in the Lord, but I'm not. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to pray. Scripture makes it clear. This is a means of grace. This is a means ordained means that God uses to commune with His people, to bless them. Or maybe you're tempted to think. Uh, blessing will not be found in meditating on the Word. I just don't believe it. Things will be the way they've always been. I'll feel the way I've always felt, uh, whether I read or not. Where is that coming from? Where does that, that thinking come from? Does that come from God or somewhere else? And then lastly, verse 6 you have the contrast. Uh, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now when it says God knows the way of the righteous, obviously this means more than He's just aware of them. Because He's also aware of the wicked and what they're doing and thinking and saying. You see that in the Psalms. It's more than awareness. It's contrasted with perish. So this knowledge, this, this knowing the way of the righteous involves salvation. It involves affection and favor. It's not just being aware. Be encouraged by that. He knows your way. It's, just, it's not an uncaring knowledge. Uh, he loves his children. He saves them. And blesses them. Then Psalm 2. Let me read that for us. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He, sit, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. Here's your royal psalm, the beginning of the Psalter. In this introduction, you have a wisdom psalm and you have a royal psalm, talking about the reign of God and in particular the reign of His anointed. You know, in light of the first psalm, what assures us that keeping with divine instruction will lead to blessing and happiness? One answer to that is the Lord reigns. That's why. 
He reigns. And the kingship of God is a key theme throughout the Psalter. Perhaps the climax of that theme is seen, um, I think, in Psalm 93 through 99. And those are the psalms that often begin with, The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. And think about, you know, many of the psalms being in the context of David and his life as king and the promises to him as king, which he ultimately did not fulfill. You know, some of the promises, if you read 2 Samuel 7, what we consider the Davidic covenant, that's how it's referred to later, is it's about his reign and his kingdom that will last forever. Well, David didn't last forever. But he, his kingship was a type of the anointed one, type of Christ's reign and his kingdom, which does last forever. Um, some highlights from this psalm. Why did the nations plot in vain? Because the Lord reigns. That's why it's vanity to plot against the Lord. And he has set his king on Zion, his holy hill. It's interesting the word um, used for the wicked plot, the word for plot there, is the same word used in Psalm 1, verse 2, for meditate. So you've got this contrast. You have... Uh, the righteous man meditating on the law of God, and you have the wicked man in his meditation in complete opposition to God and his law and his reign. Now, a couple application points to take away from the beginning of this second psalm. Um, Acts 4, verse 24 and following, quotes verse 1 and 2 of this psalm. And the context there is that the Jews were against, they were opposing Peter and John and their proclamation of the gospel. And they were taken into custody and later released. And they go to be with uh, the believers that had been gathered. And they prayed. And they quoted these verses. And they asked for boldness to continue to proclaim the gospel. And the Lord intervenes and strengthens them to be able to do that. So it's interesting that verse 1 and 2 here, very practically, according to Scripture, this should encourage us to know that the those who are set, setting themselves up against Christ in His reign are doing this in vain. They will not stand. They will not thwart His reign or His purposes. We should be encouraged by that in prayer and then pray, Lord, give us boldness in light of this truth. Help our unbelief with it and then give us boldness to proclaim the gospel knowing this to be so. And this, you know, this is a good remedy for fretting. You know, I mentioned that last Sunday in the sermon. The temptation to fret over the wicked, seemingly getting away with stuff and scheming and manipulating things. What does this psalm tell us? His reign is not shaken by any of that, no matter if all the kings of the earth gathered together, not just one or two nations. His reign is not shaken, no matter what the opposition, and it says, the Lord laughs, and He will judge. Know that about God. Know that about Christ and His reign. It's not shaken. And He can laugh at the futility of the raging that goes on against Christ and His kingdom. And then secondly in this psalm, in verses 7 through 9, these are verses that are alluded to and quoted in many other places in Scripture. 
Um, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me. And you can see how David could be saying this. Because he was the king who received these promises, but he wasn't the ultimate fulfillment of those promises. They ultimately speak of the Messiah, the Anointed One. Uh, Today you are my son, I have begotten you. This is quoted in Acts and the book of Hebrews associated with Christ in his resurrection, his completed work, where he begins his exalted reign at the right hand of the Father. In verse 8, it says, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. This mirrors the language in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, talking about the Son of Man and His reign, His kingdom. Verse 9, You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This mirrors the language that you read in in Daniel chapter 2. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue and how uh, a little stone not cut by human hands is thrown and the thing shatters into pieces. And that stone, the interpretation is the kingdom of God. When did that begin? In terms of fulfillment, it began in Christ's first coming. Kingdom of God is at hand. Interestingly, the shattering of a vessel like this in judgment appears later in, in Revelation 19, talking about his second coming in his judgment. So you see even the relationship between verse 9 here in Christ's first and second comings in his fulfilling work. And then in, lastly, in verses 10 through 12. Um, we get uh, a call for a response. And the call is to the kings of the earth and the nations to submit to the Lord, to serve with fear and rejoice with trembling. And then culminating in verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Get this reference to kiss the sun. What does that mean? It obviously means a positive response to the sun. But the picture here is of a conquered and submissive uh, king bowing down and giving homage to the victorious king. Bowing and willing Submission and acknowledgement of the victorious king. What's your disposition and response to Christ right now in your life? You could look at this as, oh yeah, obviously this speaks to those who are opposed to the kingdom, right? Those who are openly uh, opposing and unbelieving. They need to take heed of this warning. But what about us as kingdom citizens or who profess to be believers in Christ? Should we not, using the language of Scripture, work out our salvation with fear and trembling? I'll read from Philippians 2 where that comes from. And just think about application in terms of submission to the Son. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So even in that passage, we see some resonance there with this idea of submitting, fear and trembling. 
don't we live in a world that's like a wicked and twisted generation, darkness all around? Are you holding on to the word of life? Are you meditating on the word of life? Shining as lights in a dark world. So these two psalms, Psalm 1 and 2, and there's much more that can be said about both of those, they present two types of people. But taken together, we also see that the righteous are blessed and prevail over the wicked who are judged by God based on one's association with God's anointed king. See the, the connection, okay? In, verse, in uh, Psalm 1, Blessed is this man, the man who delights in the law of the Lord, meditates on it. But we also have blessing in the second psalm. Blessed are all those who take refuge in the Lord's anointing. Those two things are connected. It's not just you, know, you obtain blessing through meditation, but you obtain blessing through the Son. Taking refuge in Him. So you see sort of the law and gospel themes intertwined there in these psalms. So these two psalms form an introduction to the whole. You, know, you have wisdom themes, you have royal kingship themes that we'll be seeing along the way. Many Christ connections to be seen um, as we look at these selections from the Psalter. But I want to close our time uh, with one practical reflection and encouragement. You know, I said earlier, the Psalms are simultaneously the words of God's people to God and God's words to us. That's an interesting dynamic. You know, if you think about prayer, your prayer life, how often do we struggle both not only to be willing to pray, but knowing what to pray for, what to say to God. And the principle I want to put before you this morning is that we find our voice. We find our voice in prayer in the Word of God. You may be familiar with John 15:7. It's one of my favorite verses about prayer. It's where it says, Jesus tells his disciples, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Sometimes people latch on to the last part, ask for whatever you wish, and divorce it from the first part, and come to all kinds of conclusions about what that means. Either concluding, so you can get whatever you want, or you conclude, well, I don't see that happening, so this verse can't be saying anything positive in that regard. But what you'll see is there's two qualifiers, abiding in Christ and His words abiding in you. With those things happening, ask for whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. Maybe this seems like a, a catch. See, this is the fine print. I really don't get everything I wish for. It's qualified by these other things. But you know, there's problems with that. If we have that hard attitude. And what are we wishing for? What good are we striving after? We should not wish for anything but for what God has promised in His Word. That's the greatest delight, is to ask for those things. Things that he's willing to give, and he tells us that in his word. Here's a, just a self-reflection question to consider about your prayer life. Do you believe that asking according to Scripture is better than anything you could come up with to ask for? in prayer. Do you believe that? I think God 
directs us in Scripture to find our voice in His voice. To pray His words back to Him. And we see this modeled in the Psalms and all throughout Scripture. So, here's my challenge for application as we close. I don't know if you're using the reading challenge for St. Andrews. You may be using another plan. That's fine. But if you're using the reading challenge for St. Andrews, you'll see that every week there's a psalm. We read it on Sundays, moving through the whole Psalter. Use that psalm for prayer each week. As you look forward to the coming Sunday, read that psalm and be praying it throughout the week. Praying God's words back and finding your voice in His voice. You can't take refuge in Him without talking to Him. You can't do it. You can't take refuge in the Lord without talking to Him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words that we read this morning. Help us to meditate on them. Help us to think through them. And that your Spirit would use that to reshape our perspective. I'm sure many of us are struggling with discouragement and thinking that our labor is in vain in light of all the opposition of the world, and that your kingdom is not advancing. Lord, give us your perspective. Help us to know the truth and to live in light of it. And Lord, prepare our hearts now as we go to worship you in the next hour. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.